Today is August 8th, 2006. I am Sarah Locker. It is a pleasure to conduct this interview for the Dakota Memories Oral History Project at the Laird Tabernacle in North Dakota. Can you state your full name? Robert Herbally. And when and where were you born? I was born um, in a hospital in Jamestown, North Dakota in 1952, uh, but came back home to the family farm there, north, 13 miles north of Lair. So. Did you grow up in Jamestown for a while? No, no, I was just born there in the hospital, but you know, my parents lived on the, on the family homestead and I continue to live there now yet. Wow. Now, you know quite, quite a bit of family history. Did you get to know your grandparents on your mother's side? Yes, I did. On my mother's side, I got to know them. Um, what were their names? Um, William and Sarah Didi. And uh, my grandmother's maiden name was Geet, G-I-E-D-T. And do you know when and where they were born? Um, they were actually both born in this country. Um, my grandpa was born down in Greenway, South Dakota, in 1893. And uh, Grandma Sarah was born in Tyndall, South Dakota, in 1891. And can you tell me what they were like? Well, uh, Grandpa Didi was a, was a strong, square-built, muscular man, uh, um, black hair, uh, he died when he was 87 and, and just had a little bit of, little bit of white in his temples yet. Uh, the rest was still coal black. And uh, for many years he, he um, wore a, kind of a black Hitler-type mustache, which we never liked too well, but uh, uh, that's what he did. And uh, Grandma uh, Sarah actually had a, a little bit of Dutch blood in her. and. Uh, she was a tall blonde woman, was tall for her, for her time. She was about 5'9", you 5'10", know, five, five, as was my mother. Um, um, very, um, she was a very generous person. I mean, you can never, never walk into her house without getting fed, you know. And, and uh, she'd always, when the kids came, would always empty out her coin purse. You know, we'd get all our change every time we left. So, uh, you know, just... Uh, just very giving and very generous in that way, and especially was known for her, for her food hospitality. If she could feed someone, that was, that was uh, uh, her glory. But uh, for all her working around food, she was just as skinny as could be her whole life. So uh, apparently fed, fed others, but didn't eat much herself. <laughs> what kind of foods did she cook? Oh, just the traditional German stuff, the, the, the cheese buttons, the, the Kuchen, the, um, uh, oh, the, the uh, called Lachinda, it's like a pumpkin turnover, or they'd put apple in it, or that sort of thing. Uh, a lot, just a lot of baked goods, a lot of, a lot of doughy stuff, the strudels, the dumplings, Nepla, all of that. What was your favorite meal that she would make? Probably strudels, strudels, and then put choke cherry jam over the top of that. Still is a favorite. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> Did they ever share stories of what life was like for them growing up? Did you ever hear anything? They, um, uh, Grandpa Didi, you know, always talked about his parents coming from the Odessa area, which uh, the, the actual village was Johannesdal. And um, his father was a blacksmith, so he talked about how, how good a blacksmith his dad was, that when he uh, you know, would forge two, two items together, that, that it would hold. <laughs> and he bragged about that a lot. Uh, his skill was more into to carpentry. After he retired off the farm, he actually built some houses in, in Jamestown when, in his retirement. So. Um, but um, yeah, Grandpa Didi talked about uh, uh, you know the struggles they, they had you know living on the prairies there at, at Greenway and uh, you know just um, you know some of the sad stories of you know little 
a little brother that he was very close to at four years of age got uh, got kicked in the head by a horse one day when they were leading him to the water and that you know that even even in his older years that still you know stood out as a traumatic event in his life and um, that sort of thing do you remember any other stories that he shared mm -hmm. Yeah, when uh, when they first got married, um, you know, they they lived on a, a small farm, um, actually uh, north of Greenway, uh, into North Dakota, um, around the Venturi area, and then um, had their first uh, two children, and then uh, uh, talked about loading everybody up in a wagon and a, and a few cows and, and herding them and, and settling them south of Streeter um, in 1916. That would have been a year before my mom was born. She was born in 1917. And so, uh, you know, I talked about the, you know, trailing, trailing their female cows and a couple of sheep and, and uh, the wagon trip up here and finding this, this spot, which uh, was actually just three miles away from, from uh, my paternal grandparents' homestead. How many children did your grandparents have on your mom's side? There were six total, uh, four boys and, and two girls. And they were all spaced uh, anywhere from 17 to 24 months apart. Uh, Walvin was born in 1912, and Arnold in 1914, and Bill in 1915, and my, uh, my mom then in 1917, and another brother in 1919, and her sister in 1921. So. So close together. Yeah. <laughs> Were they religious? Uh, very much so. Uh, my my grandma Sarah was a Seventh Day Adventist, and uh, and uh, my grandpa Didi grew up as a in the Congregational Church, but uh, but did did convert after a time. Uh, you know, the family stories was too that he was kind of a you know, a tobacco chewing, cigar smoking kind of guy, and so the the Adventists didn't really accept him uh, early on. But uh, but somewhere somewhere in about the 1920s, he he gave that all up and embraced the faith then, and actually became a lay speaker within the church. So, uh, and now, so with the Seventh Day Adventists, how does that religion compare to the Lutherans and the Catholic Germans? Um, just a, a few differences. Of course, the most obvious is that, is that they had their worship day on Saturday, um, which they felt was more more um, traditional to the to the Jewish faith because you know they they met on Saturday and they also uh, adhered to some of the Jewish uh, traditions of not eating pork and and that sort of thing. So. Um, other other than the day of the day of worship and some dietary things, there there really wasn't a whole lot of difference. You know, uh, basic Bible belief and you know was was pretty pretty fundamental yet. Okay. Do you know if any of the different religious groups, the German Russians, do they treat each other differently? You know, would the Catholics be, treat the Lutherans different, and would they treat the some the Adventists differently? Yeah. Well, the the story was always told that um, that the uh, that the Catholics would persecute the Lutherans, and the Lutherans would persecute the Baptists, and the Baptists would persecute each other. <laughs> That's kind of a standing joke of the day, but uh, um, but I still remember a very very distinct uh, separation within uh, uh, Catholic and, and Protestant families. Uh, um, you know, the, it, it was uh, just something awful to marry outside the faith, whether, you know, a Catholic was going to marry a Protestant or vice versa. It, it was, was uh, just something that was really frowned on, and, and that, that is pretty well um, left. I mean, my dad even talked about going to auction sales, and the Catholic men would stand on one side and, and, and the Protestant on the other side of the rack, and... And nowadays, of course, you don't see any of that, and it's it's not not ever questioned. But uh, yeah, he all he always said, you know, if a Catholic wanted something, you could never get it bought because they they'd hang together and, and get what they wanted. So, um, 
but uh, any and even with, within that, uh, uh, the German and Russian were very clicky. Even you know they're protecting their religion, the, the the Catholic and the Lutheran or the Catholic Protestant separation. But but the, it was also uh, a, a real big no-no to marry outside of your um, ethnic group. I mean, Norwegians were just you know. Uh, kind of the scum of the earth, you know, and, and even, and that even translated back in, into my uh, growing up days. Uh, uh, my dad was really upset because I was dating a, a girl with a Norwegian name, you know, and uh, Norwegian background, and he wasn't, he wasn't too pleased with that, so. That's really interesting. Did your grandparents on your mother's side, would they come visit often? Or did you go visit them? Uh, well, when I was real, real young, they were still um, uh, pretty active in, in driving out. He, he drove an old 1956 um, Chevy. Well, at the time, I guess it would have been a fairly new car. And uh, they would come out and spend maybe two, three days at a time. And they, you know, my mom had two brothers that lived with, within five miles of us, so they'd kind of come and visit the kids and stay a little bit. And, and then, of course, uh, uh, you know, Jamestown was uh, was still an all-day event. I remember with our '52 Chevy. You know, the, well, it it was gravel road up up to where the interstate currently is running now. It was gravel up to that, and then then that was just a two-lane paved road. But it was that was so cool to be you know, on the smooth blacktop road because man, you could fly on that. You know, compared to bouncing on the gravel till you got to it. And uh, but uh, yeah, Jamestown was an event to, to go to, you know. Now we'll do that in the forenoon and come home and think nothing of it and go back that evening for a ball game if, if we need to, you know. So. so you would have gone in the morning and come home in the evening? In the evening. Yeah, you had to get home in time to milk cows usually. It was kind of, you know, the milk cows kind of dictated how long you could be gone, but you'd, as soon as, as soon as you get cleaned up in the morning, you'd, you'd take off and then try to be home. And, Sometimes you'd push it a little bit, you know, the cows would maybe have to wait an extra hour, but uh, we'd, we'd have to get there. They won't be too upset by then? <laughs> Not usually. Do you know when your grandparents on your mom's side died? Yeah, Grandpa uh, died in 1979. He was, would have been 87. And, uh, and I believe Grandma died, I want to say, um, she was 94, so uh, that would have put her about 1988, probably. What about your grandparents on your father's side? Never did get to know them. Uh, uh, I just have always, for some reason, felt a strong connectedness to them just because uh, um, the family had talked about them so much and, and they were... Uh, uh, you know, really family-oriented kind of people, and um, so they were very alive to me, but I never did get to know them. Um, my uh, grandpa's name was Heinrich, and he was born um, in Tiplitz, uh, which is almost due west of Odessa in Bessarabia, and he was born there in 1871, and um, so he came to this country then with his parents and another brother in 1889. Uh, two other brothers had come as early as uh, 1885 and had been working here and, and then had, um, they had started out down in Yankton, South Dakota and uh, then had gotten jobs as the railroad built west, uh, um, wound up in Eureka, South Dakota when Eureka was just uh, a brand new town being built, and uh, and then from there, um, everything was feeding out, kind of from Eureka going north up here and into uh, while well, it was still Dakota Territory then, um, and so they they had done some scouting and then had written back home and encouraged them to come, you know that, uh, and we have some of those letters that are are translated, uh, talking about uh, encouraging them to come. Uh, You'll never find peace in Russia, and uh, and so uh, they 
And uh, this one uncle was very, very descriptive in, in the, the political scene at the time. He said, you know, there, you know uh, this homesteading may, may close down because there's going to be an election and if a Republican president gets in, you know, it might change. And so you need to get here and, and uh, all of that, you know. So he's, he's pretty savvy to the time. And, and he talked about, you know, where you wanted to, to homestead because he had, had seen, you know, that they first have to settle an area and then the railroad will build to that area. And, uh, and so uh, he had that figured out and how that, uh, the land values would increase once the town was established. So, you know, you could get the land for nothing, but, you know, within five years you could, you know, sell it for, you know, 10 times your, your investment. And so, um, but he had uh, written back and given him very specific instructions and, on who to see, what, what ship to board, and, and all of that. So um, they, they did come then in May of 1889, my, my, uh, my, gra my great-grandparents, my grandfather and his, his um, other brother, and uh, joined up with the two brothers that were here, uh, met them in Eureka, and uh, bought, a, bought a wagon, a, a team of oxen, and a couple of horses, and uh, bought some furniture, and uh, and headed north um, through Hoskins, which is now the Ashley area, and, and came up through here. Uh, you know, Lair was was started in eighteen in eighteen ninety eight, and they were here in eighteen eighty nine. So um, they were here well before Lair. Uh, Cullum over to the east here started in eighteen ninety two. Uh, street or to the north started in 1905, so they they literally were out here in the middle of, of nowhere. Um, my uh, uh, they all took up homesteads, the the parents plus the four brothers, and uh, then eventually a couple years later added a tree claim to that yet too. You know, so they could by planting 10 acres of trees they could gain another 160 acres. So. Um, and there was, uh, right a few miles south of where we're living now, there was, a, and the old maps still show it, uh, a proposed Northern Pacific Railroad route, which never materialized. So 100 years later, we're still living far from every place because the town that they thought would be built never, never was. But uh, in the early days, they had a choice of either going to, to Eureka, to Dawson, or to Edgeley for supplies. And each, each trip would have been, you know, in that 50 to 60 mile range, which uh, with the oxen would be about a three day trip. And um, in about in 1893, my, uh, my brother, uh, my brother, my grandfather Heinrich and his brother Andreas, Andrew, um, were taking wheat to Edgeley to, uh, to have it ground into flour for their winter supply. And uh, they got caught in a snowstorm. And uh, they untied the oxen beside the wagon and then flipped over the wagon box and then rode out the blizzard uh, underneath the wagon box on their, on their way back. So um, it was some pretty incredible you know, hardships that they, they went through. Uh, you know, their first couple of years, um, they they weren't able to get a well either. They had built their sod homestead, and uh, there was an open spring that would uh, stay open all winter, about um, two miles uh, from them. And so every three days, they'd drive all, all the stock down there so they could water up. And then, then this was during the winter time, of course, you know, and then to, and then drive them home again uh, yeah, in their winter time. You said that your your father's side of the family shared a lot of stories about your mm -hmm. grandfather. What other kind of stories about him did they share? Did they, did they allude to what kind of a, a guy he was? Yeah, my, my grandpa Heinrich was a, was a real quiet man. He wasn't, wasn't very assertive. He was the baby of the family. And... Uh, uh, but very, very talented with, with wood, uh, with, um, was a good builder. Uh, there's a granary and a, and a machine shed on our farm that, that he built that are, you know, the roofs are still as good and as straight as the day he put them up. And uh, uh, very good builder. Um, 
in his later years, you know, he was he was very crippled with arthritis. In fact, his hands became very gnarled up by the time he was in his 40s to where he could couldn't do very much outside work anymore. Um, uh, but he could whittle yet, and so he would uh, whittle um, uh, like be perfect eggs, you know, that he, wooden eggs that he'd he'd whittle, and uh, and little wooden shoes he'd, you know, for darning socks and, and that sort of thing. He'd he'd do that, and then all his grandkids he'd build little little wooden benches for them. Uh, every every grandkid that you know was born before he died, got one of those benches and um, was very uh, talented that way. Um, one of the stories that, that I always, uh, which, which seems to be out of character for him because he, like I said, he was kind of a mild, mild-mannered man. Um, he had a team of horses that were, were kind of uh, high-strung and were giving him a hard time. Uh, he had bought a, a nice two-seated buggy in 1910 and uh, and the horses that he had, that the, these high-spirited ones, were were Topsy and Kate. And he had come into town, um, go, going back up. The buggy was designed so that the back seat would come off. In fact, we still have the buggy, and so then it was like a spring wagon. Uh, you know, you could haul haul more supplies that way. And and um, these horses were giving him trouble going to town. And on the way home, they were still kind of acting up, so he just laid the whip to him, and, and we lived 13 miles out, and he made the trip in 35 minutes uh, with, with a team of horses on the buggy. So that's, that's moving along. That's, that's just almost averaging 30 miles an hour to get, to get there, so. Uh, it's kind of a long way to take horses that fast. Yeah. Do you know if they, did you ever hear any stories if they were religious or not? Uh, they, they were a very religious family. Um, uh, the, the, the whole family history goes back, uh, uh, well, prior to even uh, their time in Russia when they were still living in Germany. Uh, there was this, what they call the Pietist movement, and, and uh, they, were, they were a part of that. And, and probably one of the reasons uh, that they that they did leave Germany was was for some religious persecutions, you know, that uh, they weren't really accepted and and uh, you know were able to go to Russia under you know Catherine the Great's offer of this this land over over there in the Black Sea and and uh, so my my grandfather's grandfather left Germany in in 1817 uh, it was a little village um, southwest of a Stuttgart by the name of Giltigen, and uh, and there's there's still Herbaly family living there today yet, uh, um, but uh, uh, but uh, the religious life uh, uh, was was very strong in the colony. It was a evangelical Lutheran colony, the colony of Tiplitz that they lived in in in, in South Russia, and. Uh, um, you know the Bible readings. Uh, while well, their whole school was even centered around religious training, and, and the home uh, home life was uh, you know very structured that way, and uh, that continued on once they got here too. Um, I think one of the the difficulties uh, of of living out here in the prairies in in Russia, they lived communally. You know, they lived they lived all in the villages and then went out to their tracks to farm, but. But had that social connect at home uh, within the village, but out here in the Dakota Prairies, uh, the Homestead Act said you had to live on your quarter, and so there was that disconnect. So I, I think there was a tremendous uh, loneliness in the people at that time, and I think it was really, you know, is their faith that that they could that would really sustain them through those through those periods. Um, you know, my dad talked about um, well his his whole life as long as as long as my grandpa was living, uh, they did not begin uh, the day's work without uh, after breakfast kneeling by their chairs at the table and praying before they went out for their for their day's activities and and when they couldn't go to church, uh, 
uh, for various weather reasons or because it was a circuit riding preacher and he wasn't due to come around that week, uh, then they would have services at home uh, just with their own children. You know, they would uh, you know, have um, devotional tracts or, or Bible stories that they would read and, and spend time reading and praying and then they had their, their song books too and do, do some singing that way and, and would, would maintain a, you know, a, a day of rest and a day of worship whether there was church or not. So. And even, you know, making the effort to go to church. Uh, when they first got here, the, the church out in our area there wasn't built until 1898. And so in that whole period, they, they, uh, they met in homes uh, for worship services. And then, of course, these traveling uh, preachers would, would come around and, you know, on a circuit of maybe every three to four weeks uh, would meet in the home. Uh, uh, my grandparents, uh, Heinrich and his wife Elizabeth, uh, actually got married uh, in a house that's still setting out there in, in 1894. And uh, she, uh, we, we haven't talked about my, my grandma much, but she was born in, a, in South Russia as well uh, uh, in a town by the name of Blatsky, but I've never that's what shows up on her birth certificate, but I've never been able to find it on a map anywhere. But uh, so I don't know if the spelling's wrong or, or what. But uh, um, but she and her her family we don't know much about because uh, um, apparently the parents died young because the kids came in in different waves. Her her older sister left. She she actually traveled alone to this country as a, as a young girl and and joined up with her older sister who was like 13 years older and and um, then her brothers uh, wound up settling in Oregon and weren't even part of the Dakota settlement. Um, she was working as a hired girl in the area when my grandpa met her and uh, and then like I said they got married in 1894 and, and uh, but uh, you know obviously um, that whole Religious upbringing was was a, a part of her her growing up as well because uh, you know my dad talked often of her as you know really being the spiritual leader of of the of the house at times you know if um, you know when it came to those Sunday services of of needing to to share a lesson with the children you know she took took the lead in that and um, you know and. and and once the church was was built, uh, it was about five miles from our place. And at that time, they were still a young young couple, uh, struggling, hadn't had any kids yet, and and um, didn't have a buggy. So when they went to church, they had an old hay rake, and my grandma would sit on the seat of the rake, and my grandpa took a board or a plank and laid it across the frame of the rake, and he sat there. So uh, you know that shows some pretty. Pretty good dedication if you're willing to go to church on a rake. <laughs> How many children did they later have? Uh, they had nine, nine in total. Uh, the eight, eight lived to, to adulthood. Uh, um, the first child was Matilda, and she was born in 1896. And um, the second one was Lydia, and she was born in 1898. Uh, but there was a diphtheria epidemic in 1898, and uh, and Matilda died in that. Uh, you know, the uh, you know they said she was a very you know bright girl, very you know even as a two-year-old was was pretty fluent in talking and, and all of that already, and uh, and uh, you know it had to be be a very very hard thing you know to lose a child. Uh, um, but it, it, that diphtheria epidemic was just rampant through the whole area. Uh, they lost the one child, and then uh, uh, my grandpa's brother Andreas, they lost two, and his brother Jacob uh, lost four children in that epidemic. Uh, so, um, it's, uh, it, you know, it's just one of those stories that, that survived time, you know, because it, it, it stood out as a traumatic event. And, and then in uh, 1900, they, they had Anna, 
1902, they had their first boy, Martin H., Martin Heinrich. And uh, then in 1905, they had Christina. And in 1905, they took, after Christina was born, uh, they packed her up, uh, left, left the other kids with, with the uncles here, and took a train and went out to Oregon to potentially maybe look for maybe settling out there. They went to visit uh, my grandma's brothers who had homesteaded there. She hadn't seen them since they had left the old country. And so it's kind of a twofold trip uh, to, to see the brothers and then as well to see if, if they maybe wanted to make the move. But apparently they didn't because they came back. And, and uh, about that time too, uh, they, uh, they moved in a, a larger two-story house. Uh, took like 24 horses on, uh, with these moving beams to, to move this house in a nice two-story house. Uh, prior to that, they had uh, they lived in a, a rock sod combination shanty on, on Grandpa Heinrich's homestead, but uh, they couldn't find water there. So then uh, in uh, 1896, they, they had um, uh, built a barn on the tree claim quarter, and uh, and then went ahead and took the, one of the leans of the barn and made living quarters in it, the, the north lean. And, and even as a little boy, I could still st still remember seeing the plaster lats and stuff inside that lean. Of course, we had converted it to cattle by then, but uh, but so they lived in the lean of the barn until 1905, until Christina was born, and then they moved that house in. And then my uh, then there was another sister born in 1907. That was Emma. My dad was born in 1908, and uh, and then his then the next brother was born in 1910, and then there was a gap until 1917 when the youngest uh, Herbert was born. The one born in 1910 was Walter. So, so that's the the children. Wow. Since your grandfather, your grandma and grandpa, that side of family, did come so early. Do you know if, are there stories that remain about them helping everybody else out and kind of being the, the go-to family? Yeah, yeah, you know, the, the, the planting, the harvesting, uh, those are always done communally. The, the butchering was done, done together. Um, you know, new families coming in uh, would be helped by the ones already established. Uh, um, my my grandma Herbie Elizabeth uh, was a midwife, and um, she uh, my dad tried counting you know just family groups together, and back then everybody had you know from eight to ten, eleven, twelve kids, and and he was just pointing around the area that while well, she delivered eight there, she delivered and he came up with well over two hundred babies that she had delivered, and and um, I know when we have our family reunions uh, a couple of years ago they had asked who was delivered by Elizabeth and you know everybody prior to 1933 in here raised their hand you know so um, so in addition to doing that she was also uh, called upon at death as well and, and she helped prepare the bodies for burial too so and uh, uh, did a lot of medical kind of things uh, uh, she was good at bone setting and and uh, and other uh, herbal type remedies that she'd She'd uh, have for various sicknesses. She was called on a lot uh, to help out in that respect. Do you have any idea where she learned those remedies from? Uh, like I said, we don't know much about her side of the family, but I'm assuming it had to had to come through through that line. Uh, Somehow or another, definitely. Yeah. When did these grandparents die? When did they pass away? Uh, my grandma Elizabeth died in, in 1933. She had been like 55 years old. Um, uh, she was a hardworking woman, um, you know, especially as, as my grandfather became more disabled with its arthritis. She, she was, uh, you know, called upon to do more and more uh, of, the, of the heavy work. And, uh, you know, my dad talks about her uh, shearing sheep and like uh, with these hand shears. Um, she could do 50 of them in a day, you know, and, and that's, that's pretty good work for a woman to be wrestling the sheep around, you know, sitting them down on their back and then getting their coats taken off. And, and she could do, do up to 50 a day doing with those hand clippers. And, uh, 
um, and you know pitching bundles and all that so um, I say that to say <laughs> as a result of her hard work she wound up with a hernia and and so uh, she was in Bismarck and had that surgery taken care of and so they had sent a telegram home or however the calls came to uh, you know she was good to go home and so she was discharged and within the waiting room or this kind of a sunroom in the hospital there in Jamestown and my dad had driven up to pick her up and uh, while she was waiting um, she had a blood clot that went to her heart and, and killed her so she died uh, in the waiting room of the hospital waiting waiting to go home at, at 55 so um, you know who knows how many years she would have had had that not happened but uh, um, that's pretty young. Yeah. And then, um, you know, Grandpa Herbley died in, in 1945, and he was he was 74 years old. Um, uh, I think, you know, they suspected it was like prostate cancer or something like that. But took him. Are there any other stories that you recall about your grandparents that you'd like to share? Specifically about the grandparents, or for now, oh, or even the grandparents or their families of that generation. Well, they they valued uh, education. You know, they they, um, they they were actually you know quite well educated in in uh, in the schools in in Russia. Uh, but coming here, you know, there, there wasn't a school, so they had to do, uh, you know, some home training. Uh, they, but they, you know, did collectively get together to build these country schools and uh, were very involved in, you know, making sure the, the schools were built and then, of course, uh, opening their, their uh, homes to the teacher to stay in. Uh, my dad talked about one year they could only get a teacher for two months, and, but that was the school year, you know, and I, and I always envied that as a kid, thinking, wow, only two months, you know, <laughs> that'd, that'd be the way to have school, you know, <laughs> but, uh, um, but as a result, you know, you, um, it probably took you longer to get to the sixth grade that way, too, <laughs> so, um, I guess uh, another part of the, you know, the, the family structure, um, my great grandparents, who also came over at the same time, uh, he died in 1900, and so then, um, you know, which was very typical of all families, you just took care of your elders, you know, and so, so my uh, my my great grandma, her name was also Elizabeth, wound up living with uh, with my uh, my grandparents, you know, through through that period, and and. Uh, um, uh, my dad talks about how she was very, very, very uh, conscious of the fact that she didn't want to be a burden, you know, to the family. And, and so whenever, uh, you know, she still owned some animals or something like that, and whenever butchering happened, uh, all her meat was marked with a string, you know, some of it was hung in the cistern for cooling purposes, others were canned and whatever else. But And so, so in any... Anything uh, was prepared for a meal, uh, if it was you know like a fried sausage or something. If that sausage didn't have her particular mark or her string around it, she wouldn't she wouldn't eat, you know, any any uh, anybody else's meat that day. You know, she just would eat, you know, the vegetables or whatever. You know, she was very very. Uh, uh, I don't know what word you'd want to use, but. Uh, uh, very conscious of, of, of just being um, uh, fair, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, I, I'm always amazed, at, you know, and how, uh, how families that size, you know, lived in these small houses and, and then especially adding grandma to the mix, you know, and my dad talked about, you know, grandma had her own, her own room in the house and, uh, and uh, then the girls, 
had a room, but there's there's four of them, but there was four to a bed. They only had the one bed, and uh, and then uh, my uh, uh, dad and his younger brother Walter, they would sleep crossways across the foot of the bed of their parents' bed, and and you know just everybody kind of pack in there. And then as they got older, they they uh, got to go sleep up in the attic, and that wasn't the finished attic. It was just. Uh, you know the bare the bare rafters, and he talked about in the winter time how you know the nails that came through from the shingles how they'd just be frost coated and they'd you know be sleeping underneath that and under these horsehair robes and and then that quick jump down the down the stairways to the kitchen in the morning and get dressed beside the cook stove. So, could you explain each of these items that you okay. brought here? Yeah, this would be my great grandma's. Uh, Sunday go to meet and shawl her her dress shawl and she was born in 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 1836 as as so was my great grandpa and they were married in in 18 uh, 1856 and uh, this is a shawl that she had in tiplets back in the old country and uh, very, in very good shape. I don't know what what the linen material is in it or what it what it is, but it uh, it has it has stood the test of time very well. And uh, this was just for the special occasions. Uh, you've seen the old grandmas with their babushka type shawls. And uh, this this is something of her own knitting. Um, this is more for the everyday work, you know, the stole or the wrap. Um, Excellent work, though, just as, as a tight a weave as you'd want to find for, for being a hand-knit shawl. And then this is a, a, a lap robe that she made, and this, this was also made in the old country yet. And so all these patches uh, predate 1889. And, uh, you know, it'd be, be just interesting to know the story of uh, you know whose shirt that was or whose skirt or or where they all come from you know the the various uh, patchwork quilt. As I mentioned, my my great grandfather was uh, had a flour mill in Tiplets, and that was a wind powered and uh, and of course when the wind wasn't blowing, uh, they uh, he had to have another trade and that was. Um, uh, Fixing shoes, so these are a lot of his tools that he brought with him, you know, the awls and the punches and, and the hammer. And uh, actually used like um, for some of the stitching, uh, the tail, uh, horsehair tails, they, they were real, it's a real strong hair, you know, and they'd use that for, for some of the stitching. And, um, and I'd mentioned to my grandpa liking uh, to, uh, to do uh, woodwork things, and this is one of his projects from his older years. Um, just a little wooden foot. He made different sizes too. He had, we have a baby one and a, even a bigger one than this. And um, you'd pull your sock over that where the holes were, and then you take your darning needle and your thread, and the, that wood would keep you from getting poked. You know, as you as you did the pattern on the, on, on the socks and. And I actually, uh, it, it was a skill that my dad picked up, and, and uh, so for many, many years, even after we, I was married already in the 70s and the 80s, uh, if I had nice work socks uh, that would wear out at the heels, dad would darn a new heel back into them, and I'd wear them a long time. Part of the old frugal heritage of ours, I guess. So each of these items is pre-1900? Except for the wooden shoes, probably. My, my grandpa would have, like I said, he probably done that in the 1930s after his wife died and just kind of to occupy his time because he continued to, uh, to live with my mom and dad then after, after they got married. So it was uh, kind, of, kind of the family tradition, like I said, to take care of the elders. And uh, so he, he stayed in the home with them as well. But all, all, of, all of this uh, would predate, uh, uh, be somewhere between 1850 to 1889 would, when those tools were active or made or the blankets made. And uh, 
And we talked a little bit about uh, about the schools too. And this this souvenir booklet was from my dad's um, primary years in school, and is actually an older cousin of his, Anna Herbally, um was was the teacher. And I think of the thirteen kids or sixteen kids, thirteen are Herbalies and and uh, then there was three Horning children, I believe. So, and, uh, and this is a picture of that, of that class. I don't know how close you can see that, but uh, my dad's a pouty guy on the, on the left and bottom there. But uh, that was taken in 1916. And then in 1959, this is, I was in the same country school that's me in there, and we're sitting on the steps of the country school. Uh, generation now? Yeah, we haven't talked about okay. your father or mother yet. Don't know much about them. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing at all, huh? Let's start with your father. What, what was your father's name again? Um, his name is John. Uh, you know, he was baptized with the German name Johann Friedrich. Uh, but of course, you know, being born in America, first generation, you know, as, as he went through the school and just became John, you know, dropped the German pronunciation of it. But his baptism certificate is Johann. And can you go over again when and where he was born? He was born in, in the house on the farm in uh, July 28, 1908. As, as all we're all his uh, siblings, so. What was he like? What is he like? Uh, he uh, took after his his dad in many ways. From uh, from a, a a quiet standpoint, he he didn't like talking much about himself, or but he uh, he enjoyed a good laugh. I mean, he he, he loved laughter and. Uh, and I guess one of the one of the things that my cousins always, re, you know, as they were reminiscing about my dad was saying, uh, when they'd come back, being we were the home place, it was always to to my cousins. It was coming back to the farm, you know, it was kind of kind of their thing, and you know, their memories are but well, there was always so much laughter there, which, you know, I growing up there, I never never stopped to think about it until they started pointing that out, and I said, yeah, you know, the, we we did have a lot of good belly laughs there, you know, so. Uh, um, he did have, uh, took on his mother's work ethic, though. Uh, and, and part of that, uh, too, is because he, he truly loved farming uh, better, than, better than anything else. I mean, and, and more than that, he loved horses. So, um, uh, I mean, to him, work was pleasure. And the harder he could work, the, the better he liked it. And, uh, um, was a very very strong man. wasn't a tall man. Uh, he was only five foot six. Uh, my grandpa Herbally was only five foot four, which he got from his mother, who was only four foot eleven. So, um, you know, I had talked earlier about my my uh, my mother's side of the family of Grandma Dee Dee being being a tall woman. My mother was also five nine. So, um, thank goodness for that little bit of Dutch blood that probably gave us some height. You know. So, uh, but uh, uh, he he started working at a very early age, and and like I said, with with uh, with Grandpa having this arth arthritis problem, uh, you know, he was the first one to volunteer to stay home from school to help to to clean out the barns or harness the horses or or help in the field, and so um, you know, although you know, education was very important to. To him, and especially for us children, he really pushed us for for education. It it, uh, it it wasn't something that he liked a whole lot. He still talked about it, uh, for years how he hated to memorize poems, <laughs> you know, and they had to do do so much memory work back then in those country schools, and uh, uh, didn't like that. And uh, but a little bit of a prankster. He, he talked about this heavy set school teacher they had that was staying at a neighboring farm, and and he and his brother took some. Uh, um, some old uh, dry hay and stuffed the stove full of that 
and then then lit it. And of course, the hay will throw this big white smoke. And and so they had opened the windows, and the, the, the school, you know, the chimney couldn't handle all the smoke, so it was seeping out out of the stove. So they opened the windows, so the smoke was billowing out of the windows, and and this. Uh, this teacher was walking to school and, and saw that and started running. And the, and the way he describes her as being a little bit heavy set, he said, we almost killed her. <laughs> she was panicky. They thought her school was going up in flame. But it was, it was just hay smoke. <laughs> Did you sit and talk with your dad about what it was like for him growing up? Yeah, I did that a lot. I, I was a little pest, actually. I, uh, uh, I get teased about sitting on his lap until I was big enough to cover him up, you know, and uh, that was one of my, you know, being I was the youngest, I'd, I'd always pull his chair back after, <laughs> after we were done eating and, and sit on his lap and have him tell me stories. In fact, I, I, uh, uh, I bugged him to teach me how to read German and, and he had to teach me the Lord's Prayer in German and so I actually know some of those things that my older siblings don't just because I, I had an interest in that and pushed them on it, you know, so, uh, you know, I'd, I'd uh, you know, ask him about all the horses he had because he, he just loved horses and loved working with them and, and, um, and, he, and he could remember their names and he could remember their colors and he could remember who was teamed with who and, and, uh, and uh, all of that, and uh, he remembers the first horse. Well, actually, my grandpa bought this horse. It was a black, little black horse called Mary. They named her Mary, and, and it was the first horse that he bought you know, to, after they farmed for a couple of years. And, uh, and this horse, Mary, he could go the, the, the genealogy of that, that whole horse family tree. And he could name all. Well, Mary had, you know, Mary had Dixie, and Dixie had Beauty, and Beauty had Trixie, and Trixie had Ted, and 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 on down. And and he could and he could almost tell me to the year when when these various foals were born. And 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 the last team that we had, uh, be, uh, uh, which was a kind of carryover from from the from the workhorse days, that he he maintained the team for winter feeding, and that horse that team lived well into his twenties, and we sold him about. Well, they they just got old in about 1959-1960 in there, and and those those last two horses that left the place, um, work horses were descendants of Mary, so <laughs> he had you know he could he could tell you the whole story, but but in the meantime he he had a lot of other other horses too, and and he talked, you know he described to me the various hitches you know that with you know a two bottom plow you needed. You needed five horses. You went to three. You needed to get, you know, eight on there. And and uh, and he talked about in World War II when uh, there was gas rationing, and he already uh, had a, a tractor with a four-bottom plow at that time, uh, but didn't have enough stamps for gas. Uh, he went and hooked up ten horses and put it on this tractor plow, and then stood on the frame and, and plowed with that. And uh, uh, so. Uh, he did a variety of things that way. Uh, uh, had uh, was very proud of uh, of uh, training horses too. Uh, and uh, this this one team he talked about, uh, you know, when he cleaned out the barn, had this old um, two wheeled dump cart, and uh, he'd hook the horses onto that dump cart and just. Talk to him, you know, click to him, and he'd he'd walk away, go over and open the barn, and they'd they'd make the circle, they on their own, make the circle come in front of the barn and back the wagon into the barn, just on his voice commands without him touching the reins, and uh, the same same way when he was filling the hay hay loft, you know, the, you, you laid these great big rope slings inside the hay rack, and and uh, you know, while you're out in the hay field pitching the hay onto the rack. Um, you know, you were covering up these slings, and the, the barns are rigged up with a series of, of pulleys and a, and a rail running through the top of the hayloft. And so he'd come home with his team of horses. He'd take them around to the other side and hook them onto the rope. And, and just from the other side of the barn, he'd holler when he had the, all the ropes attached for the sling, and they would take off and, and throw that. You know, it would lift the whole load out of the rack and take it up into the up into the hayloft, and then there was a trip mechanism up there that would drop 
open up the sling and drop the hay. And, uh, and those horses would do that just on voice command. Or um, he'd talk about headering alone too. Uh, a header was a machine very similar to a swather. Um, it would cut the grain, but then there was an elevator that would auger or yeah, elevate the grain into a racks, a hay rack. So you'd be driving down the field, cutting the grain, and this team of horses pulling a rack would would be catching the the, the grain. And typically, you had a driver in the header box. Um, uh, but if he didn't have the help, he'd just put that one team over over there, and he'd he'd sit on the header and drive those four horses. And the two pulling the rack would walk beside, and if the front end was getting full, he'd click to them so they'd go faster so they could fill the back end with the rack. And, and uh, just thoroughly had a way with animals. So, um, he always said he, he preferred the horses to the cows, so, so it was his job to get all the teams harnessed in the morning while his sisters and everybody else milked the cows, so he got out of them got out of milking, never did like milking, was never very good at it. Once he and mom were married and were milking cows, mom could always, always out milk them, could milk, you know, three, three cows of his two pretty easy, you know, and I, I still remember that too. But uh, um, and another interesting thing that dad did, uh, um, he, uh, he got a, well, about in the late 20s, about, about the time he turned 20, uh, he got a contract with the U.S. government to, to supply the um, horses for the for the cavalry, and so uh, <clears throat> they supplied him with uh, thoroughbred studs. A couple of them were actually imported from England, uh, and uh, one was called Colony, which just sounds like a funny name, and uh, and another one was Gordon. They were imported thoroughbreds, and and uh, so he would. Uh, you know, get mares bred, and his his part of the contract was he had to raise the raise the horses till they're four years old, and they just wanted them halter broke, and then they would come around, you know, periodically and take all the four year olds that they wanted for the cavalry, and and uh, and then whatever they didn't want, he could have to do with as as he wanted to. So, uh, and of course, the cavalry discontinued in 1945, and so uh, he wound up with a few horses there that I still remember. Uh, I remember old Franklin uh, was a horse that, that was still around when I was a kid growing up. That was a thoroughbred left over from the old cavalry days. I, we actually ran him in some of the little local dirt tracks around here. And uh, he was named after Franklin Roosevelt, who was president at the time that, that this horse was born. So I, I knew Franklin. <laughs> did, he, did your dad share stories about you know, just kind of day-to-day -day life, what they would do as kids to pass the time. Maybe to do games that he would have played. Uh, I don't know if he talked so much about games. It was it was he and his brother Walter um, were only two years apart, and uh, and the stories I remember most about is more of the devilment that they'd get into. You know, the, the they were. Uh, um, always um, into uh, some tricks or, or prank of some sort. He, he talked about one time uh, the parents had gone to town and uh, they had found this old old gun. And uh, it was pretty rusty, but they found some shells for it too. And uh, so they didn't trust themselves, you know, to, to just really go fire it. And uh, so they, they rigged it up against the side of the barn with, with a series of strings and wires to the trigger and loaded it up and, uh, and uh, then went inside the barn and, and, and discharged it. Well, of course, the girls who, who were older and were supposed to be watching these two little boys uh, were, obviously weren't watching them. <laughs> and they were in the house, and when they heard this loud bang by the barn, they, they came running out. Well. These two were, were sharp enough that uh, that my dad's job was, and luckily they were inside the barn because it did blow up the barrel and everything else on this old gun, but uh, his job was to pick up the pieces and hide them, and Walter's job was to run around the barn and r run towards his sisters as they're coming from the house and say, did you hear that? Did you hear that? You know, so, um, you know, they were, you know, playing the innocents as well, <laughs> so I don't think they ever did know about it, but... Um, um, 
Do you have a favorite story your dad used to share? Mm. Oh, I don't know if there's there's anything particular. Like I said, I, I liked horses too, so so all the horse stories were were just uh, were something that I always always liked because I mean, what what kid wants to know what color a horse was in 1920, you know, and what their names was? But I did. You know? <laughs> um, Every kid wants their own horse, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they do. And he was good about that. I mean, he. He bought me a, a little brown horse, uh, you know, as soon as I could balance and be on it. So, and I remember riding behind the saddle on him as well, you know, behind the, behind him double and uh, going for rides as a as a little tyke with him. So, what was your mother like? Um, mother was. Um, a hard-working lady, got her hospitality gift from her mother. Uh, uh, same thing as, as her mom, uh, was happiest if she could cook something and feed someone. <laughs> and uh, in fact, uh, you know, it, it, I think it was sometimes either even frustrating for people to come to visit who'd want to come to visit, but but she would be more concerned about about getting something out and getting it on the table than than actually visiting, you know. And so, um, uh, very good, very good baker. Uh, uh, made a kuchen that uh, that that is just hard to beat. Uh, but also, you know, a hard worker. Uh, mentioned like, uh, uh, you know, she could out out milk dad when they milked by hand, and and uh, and just just strong. I mean, uh, in the in the winter time, we they'd move the separator. You know, when they'd separate the cream from the milk, they'd move it from the barn into the basement of the house, and uh, and so then the milk would be carried from the barn down into the basement. The separator would be run, and then then the skim milk would be carried back up out to the barn to be fed to the calves, and and then of course you know in a few days when the cream cans were full, and I remember her, uh, you know, taking uh, these ten gallon cream cans and wrestling them up the basement stairs, you know, and uh, the can alone must have weighed fifteen twenty pounds, and then you put eighty eighty pounds of cream in there. I mean that's it's a pretty good load for a gal to be handling, and uh, she she trucked them up from the basement and. Uh, um, was a very fast worker, very very efficient worker. Uh, you know, like I said, she'd she'd milk cows and 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 separate and and have breakfast cooking and on the table and get us out the door before we knew what was happening. You know, it was just uh, always had a had a good good cooked breakfast. You know, either pancakes or the scrambled eggs and the and the sausage and things. And uh, she'd she'd just have it. Very, very efficient around the kitchen, uh, and and could could do it in a hurry. Loved to garden. Uh, always had a had a big garden, and uh, you know she'd she would uh, probably, I think, just the speed alone would would burn up the weeds. You know the way she moved through there, but uh, but uh, she's also very, very. Uh, uh, Fretful, uh, she's a worrier. Um, uh, you know, we, in the church you talk about uh, uh, there's prayer prayer warriors. You know, who, who can really uh, pray. Well, Mom could pray, and she did a lot, but she also worried. So we always called her a prayer warrior <laughs> because uh, she uh, was always. I think her life was very blessed, but she was always afraid of the worst happening to, to to the kids or anybody else, and and you know it would be up at night until we were in and and all the time, and just uh, everything had to be safe and secure around her. Did you pastor her for stories like you did your dad? I did, but she wouldn't she wouldn't tell as many. Uh, you know, she would, she talked to some about uh, her. Uh, her country school. Um, uh, she was in a situation there where there was actually 33 kids in a one-room school, and uh, you know, you, you put that over eight grades. I, I can't imagine a teacher t 
today wanting to do that for $25 a month. But uh, uh, um, she, was, she was always proud of the fact that she, uh, she was good at spelling. You know, that's one thing she'd tell me. She, you know, spelling bees, she was, uh, they talked about having those uh, at school and, and she was usually, uh, if she wasn't the last one, she was one of the last ones always in the, in the spelling bees. And so she was, she was proud of that. Talked about an old three-seater buggy that she, she and her siblings went to, went to school with, and because they they lived a little bit further from the school than what, what my dad did to his school, they actually lived in a went to a different uh, school at the other end of the township. They didn't didn't wind up in the same school, but they were actually nine years apart in age. So uh, <clears throat> my dad, as a as a nine-year-old little boy, was driving. The, the header box or the, the wagon beside the header uh, and uh, was was up there at the Dee Dee farm helping with the harvest as a nine-year-old boy uh, the summer that mom was born. So so I always uh, would tease him about being the header box baby carriage match, you know, uh, because he's, he actually saw her as an infant, you know. And that's just eventually how they met? They stayed family friends? Mm-hmm, pretty much. Was there any arranging done? Or? Not, not in that case. Uh, all of my uh, my dad's sisters, well, except for one who didn't get married uh, um, at all, but the, the rest were all arranged marriages. You know, uh, of the older kids, um, uh, the girls. You know, they there was a kubelsman, they called it. You know, the matchmaker, and uh, they would. Uh, uh, and I'd, you know, pester my dad for those stories, and, you know, he said, yeah, you know, this, well, my uncle John Tress, you know, was brought around by a guy from Lair who had news of somebody in, down in Eureka that this young man was looking for, for, for a wife, and, oh, yeah, Henry Herbally has these girls in this age bracket, and so they'd bring them by, and they'd kind of visit and talk about it, and and, uh, you know, what can you offer? Well, I'm, you know, I've got so much land and, you know, and then, then it was kind of like, you know, I talked about the dowries too, uh, uh, you know, that, you know, each girl when they left home, they wound up with three milk cows and, you know, full, full line of, uh, uh, of, you know, bedding and, and uh, dishes and, Table and chairs, you know, as part of their dowry, and of course, you know, for the for the husband, you know, you had to have the cows and the chickens to help supply for this new bride too, you know. So the so the bride's parents wound up giving that along with the girls. So. Um, when were your parents married? They were married in in 1939. Uh, Mom would have been 22, and Dad was 31. So. He was an older guy for the time. He was an older guy for the time, yeah. Did, you, did he ever share? Did he, was he just not that interested in getting married? Was he too busy farming? He didn't share the specifics of that too much. Uh, you know, he, he was, like I said, awful busy farming and, and I think probably just having a good time as he was. And, uh, and, uh, and I don't think, you know, it was kind of to the tail end of where, where matches were being made, and I don't think he was, he was too interested in all in going down that road. He was, he was a bashful kind of man. He didn't like, didn't like crowds a lot. So. Um, and how many children did your parents end up having? There was four. Then uh, the, the first was my sister, Donna, and she was born in uh, 1942. And then my brother John Dale was named, you know, John. But uh, being dad's name was John, they even wound up using his middle name. So he's my brother Dale. Uh, and later, later on, he just used his initial as J Dale. And uh, he was born in a year later in '43. And then my other brother was born, and Raymond was born in 1945. And then I came along in 1952. Together. Real close together. Uh, I uh, I don't know if I was planned or not. <laughs> the, you know, they had uh, um, in, in the gap from from when the first three were born until I was born, um, they had built a new house, 
1949, they built a house. And back then, the electricity hadn't come through yet, the REA, but, but uh, they knew it was coming, and so my dad had, had wired the house for electricity and everything. Uh, but, uh, you know, it really didn't come till about 1951, 1952 in there that, that they started connecting people. So, he, you know, they, they lived in a new house, all wired, but still had, had to move the old cook stove in and a few other of the older things for the first few years that they were in it. And so, uh, you know, I, uh, they had given away the crib and, and all the other baby things, so I wound up with all new stuff. So, so as a result, my, my siblings think I was spoiled, but that wasn't my fault. <laughs> So is there any bit of competition then with the difference in ages? Did that create? No, I was pretty well everybody's buddy. I, I think, you know, the, the rivalries were more, were more in, in the closer age because, you know, you, you get those squabbles, you know, he's sitting across the line and that, that sort of thing. But, uh, but I, I kind of was, uh, well, I did turn out to be a, a pest at times. Uh, I'm sure I was in the way a lot. Um, my uh, my sister was good to me though. She was uh, um, left left in charge of me a lot when mom was out milking. So so uh, you know she was she was kind of the built-in babysitter. So uh, developed a pretty close relationship with her. That's pretty well stayed through the years. Um, uh, you know, the brothers, especially once they got into high school and started dating, you know, little brothers are just terrible for stuff like that, you know, so, and, and, and I'm as guilty as any of them, <laughs> so. But, Locked in on a few dates. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's talk about the building we're in a little bit. This is the Lair Tabernacle, but what's the history of it? Uh, the history of it goes back to, um, the 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 German Russian uh, desire for community worship uh, as as they came here you know they they maintained the worship that they had in the old country and and uh, the, the circuit riding preachers started coming around you know they they established various churches as towns were built uh, the, there would be a church in town and then uh, like in this case here there was a evangelical church in town that was that had four country churches all of about 12 miles out uh, in, in to, the, to the four corners of the town. And, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and that was played out many times over um, through, throughout these, these areas. And so the, the Evangelical Conference then got together and says, well, you know, we need to come, you know, get a place where you can come together for corporate worship. And, you know, Evangelical, you know, you get your word evangelism and, and, and all of that from, from that. And that's really what, what the emphasis was, you know, they, they take it literally in the scripture, you know, go, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel. And, and so this was one of their ways of doing that. You know, if, um, you know, they talk about evangelicals being, you know, confrontational and, you know, and saying to people, you know, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your personal savior? And, and you know, they believe strongly in revival. And, and if revival is to happen, it has to happen within the church people before they before they can reach out to the lost in the world and so so this is how that that all you know that that need and that desire uh, developed and and the area that that this encompassed was was actually uh, north and south dakota um, i'm sure you've heard of the the german russian settlements in the dakota territories north and south dakota is is diamond shaped you know at the south end of South Dakota it kind of comes to a point and it comes up to the border of North and South Dakota really widens out uh, a lot of German Russian settlements on either side of the border and then it, and once you get North Dakota it narrows up, up again you know towards towards the north end of the uh, of the state uh, so it's a, it's a diamond shaped uh, you could lay a big diamond across the the map of North and South Dakota which would, would pretty well catch your German Russian communities and uh, so that's, this area then was kind of picked as being central to, to that. And, and there would be people coming as far away as, as Elgin, you know, to the west, McLaughlin, South Dakota, and, 
and on down and, and, and through Bottle and, and beyond. And, uh, um, you know, covered maybe an 80 to 100, 100 mile radius from the circle. And, and uh, this started in about 1919 that they wanted to have an association. They met at various other places in the first couple of years and then before deciding on Lair. Um, actually organized um, about in 1921. At that time, they had the first meeting uh, with a traveling evangelist in, in town in Lair beside the old church building. Uh, they had stacks, old wooden shingle stacks used as a platform, you know, for the speakers and, and, uh, and then acquired this property. This was um, a tree claim. Uh, a lot of the old cottonwoods and stuff out here go back to the original tree claim. See, you had to plant 10 acres of trees on a quarter and you could get the whole 160 acres. That's what a tree claim was in it. So the Nagel family who had homesteaded just south of here had this piece of ground as a tree claim. So they donated the 10 acres with the trees for this, for this camp meeting site. And so then the tabernacle was built. Uh, oh, they had volunteer labor come in. The, the, the roof design and structure um, actually comes from some plans from Germany. Uh, uh, Reverend Ermel had, had brought those. And uh, they, they just came from far and far and near and just put this up in a matter of days. And uh, at that time it was a dirt floor and so they'd haul in either fresh hay or fresh straw every year to kind of keep the dust down. And then the benches were, were just long wooden boards, essentially. So at that time, before the pews were in here, it would seat maybe 200, 250 more people than it does now, just because of, of the narrow, narrower seating. But uh, I still remember the straw floor quite well because they'd, I'd always play in it during while well, the preacher was preaching. I'd be sitting down underneath the bench breaking up little straw, sticking them together, building stuff with them and all of that. And looking for loose change because when the offering plates would go by, sometimes it would fall out and go down there. So if you rummaged around there, you'd find an occasional dime recorder, which was always a hoot, you know, because they sold popsicles down there later on after the service. So, But um, <laughs> the services would, would uh, when they first started back in, in, the, in the 20s, would, would run uh, through three Sundays, like two full weeks incorporating three three weekends and uh, and uh, like uh, in situations of people further away uh, larger families like the mom and some of the older kids would come maybe for the first week and they'd go home and milk the cows and then dad and, and some of the other kids would come or vice versa um, they do it that way and then maybe all come together on the Sundays for the big big gathering they'd get up to 2,000 people here so that all these windows you know open up inwards around the whole thing so They'd have people lined up, they say, about five, five deep around the building, listening to the speaker. And uh, you know, during the during the day, they had a morning service, an afternoon service, and an evening service. And and the uh, um, local pastors would do the morning and the afternoon worship service, and then their their guest evangelists would would preach in the evening. And uh, and then it's uh, it would. There's there's also some people that would, that would come and camp here even back then and they they do the old homesteader thing of of tipping the wagon box upside down or they'd have a um, like these older trucks the Model A truck or a 19 you know those first trucks uh, they just put a put a tent over the box and sleep sleep on the box you know in in their tents and you could rent cots here and, and that sort of thing. So, so there's a fair number of people that would stay on the ground. They'd actually, some would actually bring a milk cow that they tie tie up down at the south end of the grounds with, by their wagon, or and bring a crate of chicken so they'd have eggs and milk and and that sort of thing while they were here too. So, and uh, it was all in German language then. Uh, it, it got to be quite traumatic when they when they started making the switch. Uh, uh, to English in the 40s because you know at that that time you know you started getting the, the the next generation of kids becoming teenagers and going to high school and cars and getting around more and of course you know uh, uh, then with World War II of course you know fighting the Germans the German wasn't a popular language anymore then either and so uh, but uh, you know it was, it was still hard for for some of those older ones to to let go uh, you know. I don't think they truly believed that, that God understood English, you know, so. 
<laughs> the, uh, uh, Are there still, or is there still the gathering? Yeah, yeah, it, it is continued nonstop that, that um, it, it, it eventually w moved down to one week and, and, and that's where we're still at today. Uh, it uh, begins on the second Sunday of June and, and concludes on Father's Day, uh, that, that tradition, part of the camp, camp meeting, uh, the gathering of the adults uh, for evening services and then, then the big Sunday service uh, still continues. Uh, and, and much of the, much of the same, you know, descendants of the same people that started it, you know, are, are still, still here and a part of it, so. It's definitely yeah. a byproduct of the German-Russian yeah. immigrant yeah, it definitely is. And these boards on the wall, can you explain what these are? What the um, it's, a mem it's a memorial board. Uh, you know, those are the, the, the first of the... Well, you, you can still add, add your name to the board. Uh, unfortunately, you have to die to get your name there. But um, it's, uh, it kind of goes in chronological order from... Uh, some of the first people, some of the first settlers are, are, are on the first board. The center section up there is the, uh, uh, the early day pastors and some of the evangelists that were through here. And, uh, uh, you know, as you pay a memorial, you can get your, get your name put up on the board. And uh, it's kind of a, you know, it, it, it reads like a German telephone book when you go through the names. They're, they're all... <laughs> And not too many that aren't uh, of German Russian descent on there. The names do look very, very German. Can you translate again what the diff what the various German phrases are? Yeah. Uh, right behind me, it's uh, Sedenk Tafel, which is just memorial board. Tafel being being a blackboard uh, or board. And then on the other side, it's making the statements. Er uh, lebt, he lives. You know, and in the middle on the cross, it's the verse of Jesus Christus gestern in Heide in alle Ewigkeit. Jesus Christ, yesterday, today, and forever. And uh, there's also another German banner right up in the rafters. It was a cloth banner, but that deteriorated after many years, so they, they painted it onto a board and left the verse there. And, it, and it's, it's a verse from Psalm that says, Lord, your word will stand forever. So... Do you have any other memories or thoughts that you would like to share with us about the descendants you shared? Numerous. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's one last question that maybe that'll stir up the memory. Why do you think it's important to to share this history of your of your ancestry? Well, they always say, you know, it's hard to know where you're going unless you know where you've been, you know, and, and you know, the, uh, knowing your family history, and especially, you know, when we talk about, uh, about our religion and our, and our faith, those are the things that, that, that really drove these people, and, and it should, should speak to us and drive us as well, too. I mean, uh, um, you know, so much, so much of our faith arises out of hardship, and their faith was strong because of the, of the hard life they lived. And you know, our lives have, have become softer, but but have they become better? And and uh, so I think there's always that that lesson to be learned from the previous generation. What 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 made them, uh, you know, come here? You know, what what drove them uh, to you know to establish new towns, new homes, new families? You know, to leave their to leave their families, you know, to in many cases, you know, uh, young people would leave and say, say goodbye, mom and dad, and know, you know, that it wasn't till next week or, or, or I'll come home at Christmas. I mean, that just didn't happen when you said goodbye. That, that was till, till we meet again in eternity. I mean, it was goodbye forever on this, in this life, which uh, I, I think it's important for us to know those stories and, and, uh, and to value where we've been, because uh, um, it's it's like uh, the sign on the cross. You know, Jesus Christ is the same uh, yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, you know, we think we're in a uh, you know fast-moving, fast-paced society that uh, 
that uh, that has come so far from that, but but yet the the heart of man hasn't moved moved at all. I mean, we we still we're still in need of of something solid in our lives. You know, we we need that faith in God and and. Uh, and uh, you know, it says God doesn't have any grandchildren. Uh, you know, we need to have. Um, and so I think by, uh, you know, we we need to reestablish in every generation a first generation faith. Uh, you know, I'm sure it's a cliche you've probably heard, but but it says you know the the uh, the convictions of the fir first generation will become the tr the traditions of the second generation. And those traditions of the second generation then become the opinions of the third, and and you know an opinion is a pretty watered down down thing, you know, uh, uh, and and I think uh, you know if we're going to be successful in life, we have to live life with conviction, and that, and that's why grandma and grandpa are important to me, because they had you know first generation conviction, and and I you know hope hope that it's become mine and that I can pass it on to my kids. <laughs>